We previously developed a simple two-level orbital model of photo excitation as involving the promotion of an electron from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital to generate an excited state where we have two unpaired electrons or singly occupied orbitals, depending on how you look at the situation. And this is, on the right, the nature of the excited state. Now that we've developed the NBO picture, which describes electrons and molecules as, as occupying natural bond orbitals that we can infer from a Lewis structure, we can sharpen this picture and get a little bit more precise in terms of what we mean uh, for an excited state. For example, if we know that the HOMO of a particular chromophore in a molecule is an n-type orbital, and we know that the LUMO is a pi star type orbital, then we can talk about the n pi star excited state, which comes from the promotion of an electron from the n orbital, which let's say again, this is the HOMO, to the pi star orbital, which is the LUMO. And so we're going to develop that classification scheme for excited states in this video and, and see some of its implications and learn how to think about reasoning from an excited state electron configuration like this, n pi star, back to a Lewis structure. And we're going to discuss a little bit what this simple shorthand notation can tell us about where electrons are located in the excited molecule. Even given the idea that photo excitation involves the promotion from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital, there are a number of different ways this can happen depending on the nature of the lower and higher energy orbitals. Equivalently, we can say that there are a number of different possible excited states that depend on the half-filled NBOs, or what we've called the SOMOs, the singly occupied molecular orbitals also. Let's focus in on this idea by looking at the carbonyl group and the different possible excited states that can exist when we hit a carbonyl group with light. One brief note of terminology here, the carbonyl group is really the functionality that is absorbing the light, we could say, in this context. This is the part of the molecule where the electrons are, are really being uh, perturbed, we might say, when the light is absorbed. And this group here that is engaging with the light has a special name. It's called a chromophore. And I'm going to use that term throughout this course to describe a functional group that engages with light. Let's first lay out the NBOs of the carbonyl chromophore in their typical energy ordering and talk about the possibilities. So we have a pi bond, the CO double bond is a pi bond, so we have a pi bonding molecular orbital that has two electrons within it. Let's go ahead and write those out. We have a non-bonding orbital. We actually have a couple of non-bonding orbitals. I'll just draw one for simplicity, and that corresponds to one of the lone pairs, one of the non-bonding lone pairs on the carbonyl oxygen. And for the LUMO, we have a pi star antibonding orbital. And so in to pi star excitation corresponds to removing an electron from the n orbital and placing it in the pi star orbital. Now to a zero order approximation, all of the other orbitals are exactly the same. What really matters here is that we have now two half-filled orbitals, the pi star orbital and the n orbital. And to emphasize that and emphasize that where the business is really occurring in the excited state is where these n and pi star orbitals are located, we use this notation where the SOMOs, or the half-filled orbitals, are listed inside parentheses, typically with the lower energy SOMO first. So the n orbital is listed first, and the pi star orbital is listed next. There's another possible photo excitation of the carbonyl group, and it involves promotion of an electron from the pi orbital to the pi star orbital. So let's now draw out the orbital configuration of that excited state and talk about how we represent that. So two electrons still reside in the n-type HOMO, but one electron has been moved from the pi orbital to the pi star orbital. So the electron configuration of the pi pi star excited state looks like this, and again, our emphasis here is on the SOMOs, on the half-filled orbitals. This is where the business is really occurring in this excited state. On the atoms, the carbon and oxygen in particular, where the pi and pi star orbitals reside. And so following the same convention of the n pi star excited state, we can represent this excited state as pi pi star, since the SOMOs here are the pi orbital and the pi star orbital. Now, I want to point out one more thing now that we have these conventions down for how we describe excited states. You'll see these terms a lot. 
by the way, and being able to unpack them into these orbital pictures is an important skill that you're going to want to develop and practice as you study molecular photochemistry. The thing I want to point out now is the fact that the elevation of an electron or the promotion of an electron has changed the situation in the excited state in terms of nucleophiles and electrophiles. And let me explain what I mean by that. Well, promoting an electron from the N level to the pi star level has opened up what we might call a hole in the N orbital. There is now a space in this orbital where another electron can enter. This means that the N orbital, we could say, or the atom on which the N orbital resides, which in this case is the oxygen, has become electrophilic. This is a low energy, relatively low energy, empty spot where an electron can reside an electrophilic site. In the pi pi star state, a similar argument can be made for the pi orbital, which now contains a vacancy where there was none in the ground state. And this is an electrophilic orbital, or we could say the, the atoms where the pi orbital is located are electrophilic, owing to the empty spot available here for an incoming electron. We'll apply these ideas more concretely when we talk about electron transfer, photo-induced electron transfer, in a future lesson. We can also think about newly developed nucleophilic reactivity. This electron, which was originally in the n orbital, has gained quite a bit of energy as a result of the promotion to the pi star orbital, and as such, it's a high-energy electron occupying an orbital. This is a nucleophilic orbital, we might say. Or we might say that the atoms on which the pi star orbital resides have become nucleophilic as a result of this promotion process. The exact same argument applies here also in the pi pi star state. This electron is profoundly nucleophilic, much more nucleophilic than it was when it was living in the pi orbital. And so another way to think about this notation actually is that the electrophilic orbital is listed first, and the nucleophilic orbital is listed second. The pi star orbital is nucleophilic because it now contains an additional electron, and that's true of both excited states. Where these excited states differ is in the nature of the electrophilic orbital, with the n orbital serving in that role in the end of pi star excited state, and the pi orbital serving in that role in the pi pi star excited state. So keep this in mind. There's actually some built-in information, some sort of hidden information in these, these labels in terms of the nucleophilic and electrophilic orbitals in the excited state. And of course, that's easy enough to derive just by drawing out these orbital energy diagrams, thinking through the electron configuration and the relative energies of electrons in each of these excited states. And of course, as I've been doing, I, I have to give a caveat here, right, that this is a zero-order description, an approximate description of the excited state that assumes minimal or essentially no structural change when we promote an electron, say from the N to pi star uh, level, and no mixing of the NBOs. So it, it assumes, for example, that the N and pi orbitals operate completely independent of one another. There's no delocalization involving mixing of the N and pi orbitals. That holds up in many cases, but in some cases it doesn't, and there we need to think through first order corrections involving mixing of the N and pi orbitals. So we've talked through the nucleophilic and electrophilic reactivity that's opened up through photo excitation. A related point, a profoundly and deeply related point, is this paradoxical result that excited states are actually both stronger reducing agents or reductants and stronger oxidizing agents than their corresponding ground states. Now this seems paradoxical because how can a molecule both be better at donating electrons and better at accepting? electrons. Well, even the simple two-level model of electron promotion to describe excitation can easily explain this result. So let's take a look at this. So ground state picture, let's say we're looking at a homo-lumo excitation. So an electron is promoted from the homo to the lumo. Very familiar with this picture at this point. What this does is it creates an excited state with two somos, a high energy somo, the somo H, and a low energy SOMO, the SOMO L. Let's think about each electron in turn, starting with the SOMO H. This is a high energy electron. In fact, it's much higher in energy than it was when it was occupying the HOMO 
in the ground state. The elevation in energy of this electron means that certainly relative to its reactivity in the ground state, this electron is easily donated. It's easily given away. In the language of redox chemistry, we could say that this electron is very reducing. It has great reducing power because of its high energy. And this explains the increase in reducing power of an excited state. An electron is elevated in energy, and this makes the excited state a stronger reducing agent than the ground state. Now, what about the oxidizing power? How do we explain this? Well, remember the other thing that electron promotion does. It leaves behind a vacancy in the SOMO L, and an electron can easily be added to this vacancy, much more easily than where we could argue the vacancy was in the ground state in the LUMO, right? Notice the decrease in energy that has occurred of that vacancy as we've promoted an electron from the HOMO to the LUMO, leaving an empty spot in the SOMO L. Another way to think about this two-level photo excitation is rather than promoting an electron in energy, we are demoting a hole, right? We are lowering the energy of a hole from the LUMO to the SOMO L, or the former HOMO. And putting an electron into the SOMO L corresponds to oxidizing wherever the electron came from, right? Pulling an electron away from whatever this excited state is reacting with. And so this shows that the excited state is quite oxidizing, a much better oxidizing reagent than the ground state is. And this explains the stronger oxidizing power of the excited state. Two things happen when photoexcitation occurs. An electron is promoted and a hole is demoted. Electrons are negatively charged and holes are positively charged. And as a result, we get both stronger reducing power and stronger oxidizing power out of an excited state. And we can quantify the amount of reducing and oxidizing power we get as the excitation energy, the energy required to accomplish this promotion of an electron from the HOMO to the LUMO.